So I would like to, I, I have the great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, to you uh, our guest speaker and then our moderator of this round table this morning. So um, Naftali Brauer, some of you have maybe heard him yesterday, but some of you are new to our, to our meeting today. So he is the CEO of Spiritual Capital Foundation. He was ordained as an Orthodox rabbi at the age of 22. He's also uh, an author, a columnist, a broadcaster uh, for BBC radio shows. He, teach, he teaches ethics and intellectual history to wide and diverse audience. So please, let's give a warm welcome to Aftali Broer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. And, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this extraordinary, extraordinary gathering. I've learned so much. I was going to say over the past few days, but it's actually just been about a day. But you cram so much into it that it feels like it's been days. So um, in, in good Jewish fashion, I'm going to begin with a story. It's a personal story. All right. Um, so it's about me. I had my first taste of power uh, at the tender age of 16. And I lost it spectacularly two months later. I was in high school at the time, uh, and a friend and I got ourselves elected to run a weekly informal educational program for the younger pupils in the uh, elementary school. So we threw ourselves into the project, we raised more money than we needed, we published a weekly newsletter, we attracted scores of youngsters to our weekly programs. We also had the rest of the high school volunteering their time and skills. In short, it was an overwhelming success it went to our heads. We took our leadership positions for granted. We were dictatorial, oblivious to anyone else's opinion. In the end, our classmates got fed up and threw us out of office. <laughs> so I learned several things from that bruising experience. I learned just how elusive and fleeting power can be. I learned about the dangers of taking myself too seriously. I learned about the importance of fostering clever alliances. You see, my arch opponent was the son of the head teacher. That was not a good idea. But most importantly, I intuitively learned about servant leadership long before I knew there was even such a term and, and a literature. And I've subsequently spent much time reading and thinking about servant leadership. And it's the importance of this idea of servant leadership that I want to share with you this morning. Servant leadership on the surface is a contradiction in terms. One is either a servant or a leader. The terms represent opposing functions. Leaders lead while servants serve. So what is a servant leader? The key to understanding servant leadership lies in the motivation that propels the individual to leadership. So what is the motivation? Let me quote to you from an essay written in 1970 by the leading theorist of servant leadership, Robert Greenleaf. He writes the following. The servant leader is servant first. It begins with a natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. Then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. That person is sharply different from one who is leader first, perhaps because of the need to assuage an unusual power drive or to acquire material possessions. The leader first and the servant first are two extreme types. And between them, there are shadings and blends that are part of the infinite variety of human nature. So in other words, the essence of a servant leader is someone who paradoxically does not aspire to leadership. He sees something that needs doing. And since there's no one else capable or willing to do it, he steps up and assumes responsibility, becoming a leader. Now, the Hebrew Bible depicts two types of leaders in general, kings and prophets. Now, whereas with rare exception, the kings schemed and fought to achieve and to hold on to power, the prophets were all reluctant leaders. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the career of Moses. Moses never set out to be a leader, in fact, the Bible describes God as having a rather hard time convincing Moses to assume a leadership role. In fact, according to our commentaries, it took a good week for God to convince him. 
He was a good negotiator. <laughs> they both were. Uh, but it's only after Moses is convinced that he alone is capable of the challenging task of leading the children of Israel out of bondage that he agrees to become a leader. And this early reluctance or reticence on Moses' part is the key to defining Moses as a servant leader and to understanding a remarkable episode that occurred some 40 years later in his life. So let me tell you what happened. Despite leading an enslaved people to freedom and through a hostile desert for 40 years, Moses' people never ceased complaining, and nor have their descendants <laughs> um, sort of a characteristic we have. And finally, at the end of 40 years, it got to him. In an uncharacteristic moment, Moses seems to crack under the incessant pressure, and he begs God to relieve him of his responsibilities. And this is what he says. Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you, that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised an oath to their ancestors? I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, go ahead and kill me. If I found favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. Another great Jewish characteristic is guilting the other party. So this is what you want to do, kill me. There's humor, there's pathos. Anyone who says the Bible has no humor has not read the Bible carefully. Um, there's pathos, and, and there's a real sense of despair that this great leader has now cracked under the pressure, and he doesn't really want to lead. So in response, God alleviates Moses' burden by appointing deputy leaders to serve under him, and this is what God says. Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the power of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. So, finally, Moses has some help, some respite. He now has to use an anachronism, a senior management team. All should be well, but it isn't quite, because amongst these 70 elders, two men by the names of Eldad and Medad begin prophesying in the camp. Now, what they were prophesying about at this point is unimportant. The crucial thing is that they appear to have overstepped the bounds separating the elders, the senior management team, from Moses, the leader. Their role was to share in the burden of decision-making, not to be visionaries, not to be prophets. The role of prophecy, of visionary leadership, was supposed to have been left to Moses, and to borrow another anachronism, it was above their pay grade. <laughs> Moses' closest disciple, Joshua, was deeply disturbed by this usurping of his master's role and demanded of Moses to assert his authority by forcing Eldad and Medad to stop prophesying. And here, Moses' response to this legitimate argument is extraordinary. And I think in it, we capture the essence of servant leadership. He says this to Joshua. Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. In this response, we see a further, and I would say key dimension of a servant leader. And that is that he is more concerned with cultivating other leaders than he is with retaining followers. Let's refer to Greenleaf again. The difference manifests itself in the care taken by the servant first to make sure that other people's highest priority needs are being served. The best test, and difficult to administer, is this. Do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? So these two elements of servant leadership are inextricably linked. More than that, they are cause and effect. It's because the servant leader harbors no personal ambition as a leader 
but rather assumes the role as a form of service to others, that she is able not just to allow, but also to encourage others to shine, even if that means they outshine the leader. Now, while Greenleaf was the first to coin the terminology, as far as I know, the notion of servant leadership is an ancient one. I demonstrated its role in the Bible, but the notion of leader as enabler is equally found in other ancient cultures. For example, the founder of Taoism, Lao Tzu, wrote that a leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. And from the ancients to our contemporary time, servant leadership is what set apart great leaders from good leaders. What I would like to do is add a helpful gloss onto this ancient wisdom. And in order to do so, I need to revisit the biblical narrative in which Moses is given assistance in the form of 70 elders. God says that he will cause some of Moses' spirit to emanate and rest on the elders, which is a very difficult thing to visualize. What is a spirit? How does it emanate? How is it parceled out? How does it enter into the others? The whole thing is too ephemeral. So the great medieval biblical commentator, Solomon ben Isaac, describes the emanation, and Solomon ben Isaac incidentally wrote his commentary really for school children. So he's trying to simplify this as much as he can. He describes this emanation of the spirit as a candle drawing light from a torch. The torch being the source of light and the candle drawing that light. Meaning that just as a torch is not diminished by giving fire to the candle, so too was Moses not diminished by sharing his spirit, wisdom, authority with the 70 elders. So I'd like to unpack this intriguing commentary and doing so offer a simple but helpful terminology to think about the difference between an ordinary leader and a servant leader. It's, this, it's the distinction between fire and water. If I have a pail full of water, the water in my pail is finite. It's only as much as the pail will contain. Every drop I parcel out, every drop I share with others means that there is one drop less in my pail. And this is what ordinary leadership looks like. The leader holds a pail full of authority. Every little bit of that authority is shared, that is shared out results in a loss of authority for the leader holding the pail, which is why such leaders jealously guard this most important resource. They insist on taking credit for every good idea. They control those underneath them. Like Joshua, they try to silence others with competing visions they hold on to their pail of water. But there's another model. Imagine I'm holding a torch of fire. The fire is infinite. No matter how many people light their candles or torches or lamps from my fire source, the source is never exhausted, nor is it even slightly diminished. The servant leader holds a torch of fire he recognizes that his role is not to guard a precious resource, but to illuminate others. He gives unstintingly and discovers that he always has more to give. Not only that, but the individuals with whom he has shared his fire, in turn, share their fire with yet others, and those others with still others. And this is the beauty and power of servant leadership. It sets in motion a virtuous chain of illumination spreading into the infinite future, enabling the leader to positively influence others beyond his wildest imagination. So going back to my opening story, if I could meet my 16-year-old self, I would tell him as he rushed about, flush with self-importance and easy success, I would say, Naftali, stop and think. What is motivating you? to be a leader. If it's just an ego trip, it will not sustain. Don't start with yourself. Start with the need. Identify the need and ask yourself honestly how it can best be fulfilled and if you are the best person to fulfill it. I know now that if that's how I began, 
I would have gone about the enterprise in an entirely different way. I would have been more collaborative, humbler. I would have conducted an orchestra rather than insist on playing a discordant duet with my friend. The project would have succeeded. I would have succeeded. My friends would have succeeded. The whole school would have succeeded. How? Because I would have had an entirely different definition of success. Instead of jealously guarding a pail of water, I would have become a fire leader. True inspirational leadership is fire leadership. True inspirational leadership is not concerned with retaining followers, but rather with helping to create new leaders. True inspirational leadership begins and ends with a desire to serve. John Quincy Adams put it simply, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. May we all aspire to such leadership so that we may be a blessing and inspiration to all those we have the privilege of serving. Thank you.